Get ready to be mind blown. And now for today's hashtag lane hack with just the tip. Run, don't walk your way to simplepassivecashflow.com and sign up for the Huey Deal Pipeline Club and get in on the deal flow. Hashtag lane hack. For those who haven't heard who Gary Vaynerchuk is, he's a guru of social media marketing. His big thing is staying on top of the trends. He says that he day trades attention. He was the first person who got on the Twitter bandwagon and he capitalized on it. And now he's onto the Snapchat world. If you guys are listening to an interesting thought leader, go ahead and subscribe to Gary Vaynerchuk. And here's a sample of his work. This recording was from a recent seminar that I attended. And he talks about three things that he thinks are the keys to success. Enjoy. Seattle, I am thrilled to be here. Obviously, uh, a very unique circumstance, which I'm enjoying. I always love to do things that are new and different. And so this very much fits my mold of being on the offense, being entrepreneurial, doing things a little bit different. So where do I want to go with this talk? First, I want to give all of you some context on how I got here to share the stage with these other phenomenal individuals. It creates the framework of where my mindset comes from and then allows me to build on and really explore where I want to take you and why I think we are living through the single greatest era that humans have ever lived through. I'm very aware there's plenty of things going on in the world, but what we're able to control and because of the technologies, I mean, look what I'm doing right now. I'm probably actually eating popcorn, but I'm here right now with you. The technologies we now live in and are capable of using have transcended and have created opportunity for entrepreneurs and individuals that we could have never imagined. And so you should be extremely grateful. One of my favorite new things you talk about is 400 trillion to one. 400 trillion to one is the math behind becoming a human being. That is insane to me. It is insane to me, the math behind the fact that we're even sitting here, that we are alive, that we're in this place. I mean, I always think about, what if your mom just went and got another glass of wine, right? Like, what if your dad hit that red light? He just wouldn't exist. And so we are living through incredible times, opportunistic times, but most of all, I am completely driven by the energy that drives me. My absolute oxygen is gratitude and the opportunity to even do something about this at bat in life. Let me give you my context. I was born in the Soviet Union uh, in 1975. Uh, I came to the U.S. in the late 78, uh, at three and a half, almost four years old. My family immigrated here. We, we came here with nothing. Uh, I lived in a studio apartment uh, with eight family members came from extremely humble beginnings. Uh, it was very tough, you know, splitting toilet paper, not expecting anything. I lived a very immigrant lifestyle. Immigrants have figured it out, just so everybody knows. Here's the concept. Don't spend any money on anything for a decade. Save it and buy shit. That's how we roll. And so, for me, I'm very proud and very much my heroes. Oftentimes people are like, oh, do you look up to Steve Jobs or, or Rockefeller, things of that nature? I have zero idols other than my two parents who I look up to and love and admire and absolutely try to strive to make proud on every single day basis. They worked extremely hard. I didn't even know my dad until I was 14 years old, even though my dad slept in the house every night of my life up to that point because he would leave before I would wake up and he would come home long after I fell asleep. Uh, my dad eventually became uh, a stock boy in a liquor store in Clark, New Jersey and would drive uh, you know, an hour every day each way to get paid two bucks an hour to be a stock boy in that liquor store. Saved up his money, eventually became the manager of that liquor store, and that's really where our American dream began. First three or four years were extremely hard, and I got picked on because I couldn't speak the language, all that kind of tough, cliche stuff. But eventually we moved to Edison, New Jersey, where my entrepreneurial career began. Uh, when I was six, I had a five lemonade stand franchise. I used to ride around and pick up my cash uh, at the end of the day like I was Tony Soprano. And I would really, really enjoy that. And I would spend most of my time on probably the framework of where I want to go with this talk, which is I've now come to realize that I'm an attentionist. That the thing that I most care about is attention. That if that attention lives on Instagram and goes down in the DM, or if that attention is on Twitch, or if that attention is in hologram form, or if that attention is in outer space, that is where I will be. 
I do not care about anything other than where do you pay attention and how do I tell you my story? Whether I want to be elected for office, whether I want to sell you sneakers, whether I want to sell you wine, whether I want you to consume this content, I day trade attention. From the first talk I gave in Florida and talked about an app called Twitter that nobody understood even existed, to I stand here today, I have traded my whole career. And it started when I was six years old. The reason I did not stand behind the stands at my lemonade was not because I was fancy, not because I thought I was so special that my friends had to. It's because for eight hours on summer days, the most interesting thing in the world for me to do was to walk up and down the streets of New Jersey. I'm an 80s baby, so we actually played outside. I would walk up and down the streets, and I would sit, literally sit, on a grassy knoll, and would watch cars drive by, and try to figure out where their eyes were, so I could put the sign on the best tree or pole to get them to buy my lemonade. To just wrap your head around how sick I actually am. Like you have to be in such an insane place that you thought that was the most interesting thing you could do as a seven or eight year old. But I've been chasing attention my whole life. And then what I try to figure out once I have it is how do I story tell? How do I put out something compelling enough to make you do something? Whether that was to vote for me in fifth grade to be the president of my school, which I won, or sell baseball cards, which later became my main business. When I got smart and told my primary residents to start investing in investments that actually made sense, whoo, I needed a place to diversify quickly as opposed to some money market or some high reward checking account. Let's face it, turnkey rentals are cool and some vacations are great, but they don't come around often. I stumbled upon the American Homeowner Preservation Fund. The owner, George Newmary, once apartment syndicator too, is now sponsoring the podcast. His fund cuts the middleman out to crowdfund the solution to the mortgage crisis in America. They are empowering you to fund the purchase of distressed mortgages and earn returns that smoke any other passive fund. If you find something else better out there, let me know. Oh yeah, they work with families to keep them in their home after buying the underwater note at a huge discount. It's an opportunity to make an impact on families and communities while earning returns. Start investing with as little as 100 bucks in investinhp.com. If you want the free Burn Zone book, please send me an email at lane at simplepassivecashflow.com. When I was 12 or 13 years old, I started my first substantial business. I, you know, 41 years old. And baseball cards were like nothing. Take Snapchat and Instagram and technology and combine it to one. That's what everybody thought about baseball cards. Every guy, 9 to 15, collected baseball cards in the late 80s, early 90s. So I sold it because that's where the attention was. And when I was 12 to 13, I was making two to $3,000 a weekend selling baseball cards in the malls and convention centers of New Jersey. I don't know how you guys roll, but from an entrepreneurial standpoint, when you're 13, and you have $30,000 in cash under your bed, and you're not selling weed, you're doing a good job. <laughs> so that's how I went, that's who I was. And then I turned 14, and my dad ruined my life. He grabbed me, it was basically my 14th birthday, and he said, and now it's time to really work. And for every weekend, since I was in eighth grade, for every vacation, literally every day of my winter vacation, every day of my summer vacation, Every free moment I had in eighth grade that was not in school, I worked in my dad's liquor store, first making two bucks an hour, bagging ice in the basement, and later when I was 16, allowed to come upstairs and actually stock the shelves, and that became my life. Somewhere around 16, 17, I realized that people collected wine, and that was the connection I was looking for to what I cared about. I cared about collecting baseball cards, things of that nature, and now I was finally in a place where I finally realized something that I was interested in. Like every entrepreneurial kid that loves their family, I wanted to help the family business, but I wasn't passionate about selling beer or liquor. I couldn't find my connection. And so when I realized that people collected wine, that really changed everything for me. It really made a focus for me. It gave me something to care about. And at 16, I started reading about wine and getting into wine at a level that really no child should and became completely obsessed. I would literally go to the science class. 
I didn't give a crap about Saturn or the, the, the charts on chemicals. I still know none of the chemical crap, by the way. Anyway, I would only read The Wine Spectator, read Robert Harper's Wine Advocate. I was obsessed, pot committed, all in. I was going to open up 700 wine stores across the country, the Toys R Us of wine, I called it, and I was gonna build the biggest franchise in the world, and then I was gonna sell it, and I was gonna buy the New York Jets. That was the plan. That was the strategy, that was the plan, that's what I was gonna do, everything was great. And then I went to college my freshman year, I'm in my dorm room, playing Madden 94, dominating by the way. My friend comes into the room, says you gotta come and see this. I went into a room, there were seven guys, now kids, all the youngsters in the crowd, this is 1994. I had been on a computer maybe four hours in my life. I brought a word processor to write the papers that I never wrote. This college, I did not own a computer. I'm 18 years old. I'm sitting and I'm hovering over a guy going on the internet and for the first time ever I hear coo, coo, shh, <laughs> dial up internet. I see it, I have no idea what it is. I see something ridiculous like, is this the super information super highway? I had no idea what the hell was going on. And for eight hours, let me just say that one more time for everybody. For eight hours, I watched other people go on the internet because it was that mind blowing. I finally got my turn. And within 15 minutes of being on the internet ever, I found myself on a baseball card forum on AOL <laughs> where people were buying and selling cards and literally, Literally, within a week or two of that moment, I realized, holy crap, I don't need to open up 700 more stores. I'm gonna do this thing. And so for the next year, I read about the information superhighway, the World Wide Web, became educated, became curious. And in 1996, I launched winelibrary.com, one of the first three, com first three e commerce wine businesses in America. In the first two years, of winelibrary.com's existence on a website that we built for $15,000, which was a lot of money for my small family business, that business did less than $10,000 in sales in two years. I was in school, nobody was really running it. When I'd come home, I really had to work the floor to build a business. I don't know how many of you have a Soviet father, but Sasha Vaynerchuk was not happy with the ROI of earlywinelibrary.com. But the punchline is this, much like what I'm doing right now, when you do things early, you navigate through new seas. Sometimes you gotta eat a couple poison berries before you figure out which fruit in a new land is worthwhile, and that's what I did. Though we had a negative kind of impact on our early part, once I finally came home from school in May of 1998 and got serious about winelibrary.com, from 1998 to 2003, in a five-year window, I, on the back of winelibrary.com, on the back of starting an email newsletter in 1996 that eventually had 90% open rates in 1997 and 98 for anybody who's done email marketing that is insanity because that, nobody was doing email marketing back then and people opened every single email and read every single word because that's what you do. When you get a new platform, you consume everything. The first time you're on Instagram and you follow people, that first year, you see all the pictures. Same with Facebook, same with Twitter, it's how it works. When you buy early attention, and it hasn't been ruined yet by marketers, you consume content. <laughs> when you consume content, you get affected, and you buy things, and you do things. On the back of email marketing, on the back of Google AdWords when it first came out, I owned the word wine for five cents a click, and just rode that all the way through. Through that whole world, through that entire execution of email, website, banner ads, some of which had had 14% click through, because they were wine themed websites and people didn't know what banners were, they just would click them. I built that business from a three to a $60 million business with no venture capital on the back of something that was a $14,000 marketing budget in year one. So when I hear these kids cry about why they're not winning, because they don't have capital, or they come from places where there's no VCs, we have forgotten that the game that we are all in is building businesses that make money, not build businesses and decks that get venture capital funding. And we do that, and why I'm excited about that, and why I make that point to you here today, is because we now live in a world where that is actually practical. It was difficult for our grandparents to have a job, 
pay off loans, pay their mortgage, and then at night, get money from a bank and build some sort of business for their lives because everything was closed. We lived in the analog world. There was no internet. We should be ashamed of ourselves if we come up with excuses where every single one of us can take our phone, laying in our couch with pajamas on, yeah. and use bonbons, and Ooh. start an actual business. That's just real. Yeah. Most won't, because they don't have the talent. Most won't, because they don't have the work ethic. Most won't, because they don't have the strategy. But the fact that you can is insane. It is absolutely stunning and amazing, and I'm driven by that. Well, I mean, it was an amazing, amazing battleground for me to learn, test, try, and do my thing. Building that kind of business, we made it, right? Like, I bought my car from a garage sale. My brother AJ, 11 years younger than me, brand new Lexus. I'm not better. <laughs> this is the American dream. It was amazing. But for me, I was still hungry. I still wanted more. I wanted to achieve more, and I was starting to learn that I was more than what I thought of myself at that point. I was more than just a businessman that was good at wine. I was more than a good salesman. I was actually tapping into a skill that I never understood, which is I really understand people. I understand consumer behavior. I understand psychology naturally in the way that somebody like Beyonce sings and LeBron plays basketball, I just genuinely believe that I know how to communicate and understand what's gonna happen with that communication at an innate level that was never taught to me, that has always been there. And somewhere around the time I turned 30, after I had my newest venture, I'll never forget it, five months after it launched, a little website called YouTube, I sat there and looked at it, big shout out to Eric Castor, my lead developer, who I haven't mentioned in a talk in a long time, so it's be fun. Eric Castor was my lead developer. I sat right next to him, building Wine Library, and he's the one that said, hey, get off Yahoo, there's this new site called Google that you need to search. And I went on the website, it was this white blank page, I looked at it and I said, how are these guys gonna ever make money? There's no ads. Anyway, <laughs> he told me a lot about Web 2.0, this emerging thing, Flickr. Dig, right? Uh, Metafilter, these new sites that were causing blogs from Jason Kotke and Anil Dash. And I was learning this whole new world and it really hit an apex when YouTube came out. It came out, I looked at it, and I said, this is gonna be the biggest. This is gonna be the biggest site. You're gonna watch video online and it doesn't cost anything. A year earlier, I asked Eric if I could make videos online for the business, how much it would cost. And literally, like, if 100 people watched the video, it would have cost like thousands of dollars. It was completely not feasible. And here was a website a year later that I could upload videos, as many as I wanted, and it didn't cost me anything. It was mind blowing, 2006, right? That's 2005, excuse me. I'm watching it, I'm watching it, I'm watching it. I'm paying attention, I'm paying attention, I'm paying attention. And finally I decide, you know, it's November, December, it's the holidays, I can't really attack it, retail. And I get to January and I go, I'm gonna start something. And in February 2006, less than a year after YouTube came out, I started something called Wine Library TV. The premise was quite simple. I would sit at my desk with four bottles of wine and I would drink them. <laughs> for 20 minutes, hundreds of thousands of people started watching it. And it was the first time in my career that I started selling stuff without spending ad money. It was just the content that was driving my business. And then something really interesting happened. YouTube sold to Google for $1.7 billion. And to put it into context, back in 06, 07, that would be like Snapchat selling for $1 trillion today. It was so mind-boggling. It was so unbelievable. We were coming out of the first Web 1.0 crash, right? We weren't there yet with this whole new social media world. And I remember sitting there and saying, my God, I was so right about this. I was so right about Google AdWords. I was so right about email. I was so right about e-commerce. Because all the old folks in here right now, you remember, you remember, some of you thought the internet was a fad. Right, forget about a Snapchat fad, the internet. And so I realized then that I had to invest in this innate talent, that I had to figure out what to do with this skill. And so I decided that the next time I felt it, the next time I felt it, the way I did about e-com and email and Google AdWords and YouTube, that I would invest. And that happened four months later at a conference called South by Southwest in Austin, Texas, where all the tech companies come. 
there was an act that everybody thought was stupid. But why would anybody care if you're walking the dog? Why would anybody care if you're eating a pizza? I thought it was gonna be the next email. It was called Twitter. I got friendly with the founders. I invested in the company. The next investment I made was in a small company out of New York that was getting traction with young kids called Tumblr. The next company I invested in after I made a video that Twitter would be dangerous to Facebook if they weren't paying attention. Went viral inside of Facebook. I flew to Facebook, spoke to the company when there was like 300 people. Mark Zuckerberg came up to me and said it was really interesting what I was talking about from a behavior standpoint. We had dinner that night, and a couple months later he called me and asked me if I was interested in buying a lot of stock because his parents were selling a bunch. Yes, I was, Mark. Yes, I was. <laughs> that turned out to be a great thing. I went on to invest in companies like Uber and Birchbox and Venmo, and I've had a very nice career, Pinterest, Snapchat, very nice career in investing, uh, did really well. But then something interesting happened. I realized that I had this real gift and that I could take it further and that the Jets were within reach. But I had to eat crow for a decade. Was I willing at 35, at the height of my career, at the wealthiest I'd ever been, was I willing to take a step back for 10 years, build a client service business and eat shit, have clients bully me around, because they're my clients, because that's what they do. And if I was willing to do that, I felt that I could build the greatest marketing machine of all time, the scalable human version of what I was great at, picking trends that were gonna be meaningful earlier than most, storytelling on them properly, and building the leverage around them. And if I could do that, that I would then have the leverage to be able to go buy the biggest businesses in the world, buy them for $250 million, run them through this machine, and then spin them out and sell them for $2 billion. But that was the math. And I decided to do that. And that's how Vayner Media was born. My brother AJ was graduating from college, timing was right, I was ready to make that transition away from the wine business full time. I'd written a couple books that did really well, and, you know, kind of bestsellers, but I was ready to put my teeth into something. And now Vayner Media, six years later, is a 750 person company uh, in 2017 with our Pure Wow acquisition, which is a female modern media company, is well on its way to doing 150 to 170 million dollars in revenue. And we did this very quickly. We did it very quickly because we over-delivered. We did it very quickly with what I want to talk to you about today. Attention. If you're sitting in this audience right now and you want anything to happen, anything, meaning raise more money for the PTA or quit your job and live the life that you want, you have to start at the North Star of attention. You have to understand that before you tell me how great your service is, or your ebook, or your meals, or your sneakers, or your t-shirt, or your pictures, before you tell me how great your stuff is, you need my attention. Because if you're telling to me and I'm not paying attention, you might as well not tell it at all. And so I have now coined it as day trading attention. Because please understand, as I record this today, as I talk to you today, if this was four months ago, I would say something like, hmm, I'm really worried about Instagram. You know, Facebook is much younger than people realize. Snapchat is getting older than people realize. Where's Instagram gonna play? But over the last four to five, six months, Instagram has made the feature changes that have allowed it to go the other way. Now the question we all debate is, what's Snapchat gonna do? Because all these features now live in Instagram, and all the people that were migrating over to Snapchat now say, well, I don't need another app. I can do all those things here. And so this happens on an everyday basis. This happens on an everyday basis. Whether something stays forever, Facebook, or comes and goes, Vine, MySpace, Tumblr, they will all play out differently. I actually don't give a crap. If you ask me what's next, or what I think's gonna happen, here's my answer. I have no idea, and I can care less. I care what's happening now. I don't care if Seinfeld's gonna get canceled in four years, it's the number one show on television right now, and I will run a commercial on it. I do not care if American Idol is gonna fall off and the voice is gonna come up, because when American Idol is number one, I'll run commercials, and when the voice is number one, I will run commercials. And that's how I think about social networks. Social networks, I don't have, oh I do, beautiful. My phone, I have no idea how this works out. My phone. Social networks on this phone are the number one thing in our society where attention is. The phone, and you all know it, 
has become the extension of who you are as a human being. I would literally <laughs> rather somebody come up to me right now, stab me in the stomach, and steal my wallet, and lose my phone. <laughs> it's instrumental it is to our society, to my day-to-day life. Really when you think about the phone, when you think about what That's people true. are doing on the phone, over 50% of the time that people are on the phone, they are on a social network. This is everybody, mass collected data. Over 50%, short, 90-year-old Rick, right, spend zero, 17-year-old Sally may spend 100%, but the next score is very simple. Whether you are 90-year-old Rick, Facebook, that's right, your great-grandfather is on Facebook. Or you are Sally, nine years old, musically. We live in our phones. The phone, my friends, the phone has become the television, and the televisions have become the radio. And it's 1948. It's crazy. And what happens over the next 10 years is exactly what happened in the late 40s, early 50s in America when we became a primary television society instead of a primary radio society. Our attention shifted and some people won and some people lost. The people who are gonna lose in this audience have drawn lines in the sand. They make their money a certain way. Google AdWords, email, Facebook, YouTube. They're drawing lines in the sand. They are romantic about how they make their money. They have found something that works, copywriting on print, copywriting on a website, Instagram influencer pages that they've built up. Your one terms of service away from being vulnerable because the world changes. What if Instagram doesn't let you do brand deals anymore? Does the terms of service say they, they can do that? What if people stop using Instagram? Think that can't happen? Of course it can. So we are not thinking in terms of understanding how to maximize while we've got something and then expand it across the board. For me, I do not want to be at the mercy of any of these networks. I view this as the television, but I use Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and Snapchat and Instagram as ABC, NBC, CBS, and ESPN. And I, on an everyday basis, am obsessed with having the number one show on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat. And I know what so many people miss the boat on, which is it takes different content, in different contexts, with different strategies to be successful on these platforms. It takes something different in copy or image, in video form or cadence of timing of when you post to be successful on these platforms. So as you sit here today, first and foremost, understand this. If you want to be a successful entrepreneur, here are the pillars of success. Number one, self-awareness. If you do not know who you are, you've got no shot. If you think you're me, if you think you're somebody else, if you think you're Kevin Sistrom, if you think you're the, the gal that invented this space, if you think that you are somebody else, you will lose. I don't care what you wish you were. I need you to know who you are. I understand. Shit. I wish I was six foot five to throw a football 90 yards, because then instead of buying the Jets, I go play for them. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you want. It doesn't matter how you wish it turned out. It matters what you actually are. And we lack, in today's society, the ability to really audit ourselves honestly and accept, accept who we are. The greatest gift that ever happened to me is that I fully accepted who I was, and I had parents who tripled down on it. They allowed me to triple down on my strengths. They didn't force me to get better grades when I was making $3,000 a weekend selling baseball cards. They allowed me. Do you know how many parents are sitting in the audience right now that stopped their kids from playing video games 10 years ago who had unbelievable talent in video games and said, you'll never master anything if you keep playing video games. And now that guy is making $80,000 a year in middle management and is miserable, but if he would have kept playing video games, he would be making $4 million a year being an esports star. Parents take note, people take note. The world is always going to change. Do not make decisions today on what the world looks like a decade from today. Please project, please understand it's a marathon and it starts with self-awareness. You have to know who you are. America is very good at selling you on what you're not good at. The diet industry, flourishing. The self-help industry, flourishing. Flourishing. 
<laughs> Everybody wants to teach you and make you better. You're not good. Do you know that there are more parenting books in the last seven years produced than the beginning of mankind until seven years ago? Because we're not good enough parents anymore. We're going to buy things to teach us how to be better. Shit. I think I'm the best at what I do. I don't give a crap what you think. None of you. Zero of you. You do me. I'm going to triple down everything that I've always been. I don't know. I know my limits in music and art and healthcare and geopolitical climates. Everybody's got an opinion. Lots of opinions. Everybody's a headline reader. I stay in my lane. I know what I do. And so if you're a great salesman, triple down on sales and find a partner or hire the people that can do finance or infrastructure or operations. The pillars of success of entrepreneurship. Number one, self-awareness. Number two, Hustle. Yes. Boy, do That's I love my face. And I know you guys know it. Anybody that knows me at all knows I love it. I propaganda it. I push it. You know why? Because here's the problem. Talent. Let's talk about talent. You can only be more talented at what you naturally have to some degree. I can, I can play basketball every minute of my life from the beginning of time to today. I'm telling you right now, I would not have made the NBA. It wasn't there. I'd be a much better rec player than I am now, but there would absolutely be no NBA in me. And we now live in a time where everybody thinks that they're entitled to be an entrepreneur. Let me just say it because it needs to be said. There's a very big difference between being a successful entrepreneur and being an entrepreneur. Being an entrepreneur requires the following. You go into your social media profile, you edit it, and you say, CEO of some bullshit company that makes no money. <laughs> Being a successful entrepreneur is, you're living your life, and it's good, and it's predicated on you doing it yourself. So, we are living through a time right now that so many of you in the audience are CEOs and entrepreneurs, and it's really cool, mazel tov. The problem is, when the economy gets tough, you're finished, and you're gonna work at Bank of America. So you better figure out, first, self-awareness, second, hustle. You need to work your face off. You know zero people that have been successful, zero. You know zero people that have been successful on their own merit that didn't work their face off. Why not be? Yeah, I'm sure you know some guy you went to school with that grandfather left $58 million to, and he's on the odds and he thinks he's fucking Dan Blazarian. Great, Mazel Tov for him too. <laughs> but he wasn't successful. He was trust fund baby. You know zero people that made themselves successful without working their ass off. The amount of people that now see me on TV or like getting millions of views or followers on social media that ping me, that I went to high school with or grammar school with, that's like, and if they even dare to say the word lucky in the email, I fire back in four seconds and remind them, hey Rick, I appreciate it, so good to see you. Went to your Facebook page, great kids, good for you, pumped. Real quick, real quick. That part in the email that you said I was lucky, you're so lucky, I'm so happy for you. Let me remind you, Rick, that back in high school and college, when you would go to the Jersey Shore and drink beers and bang chicks, I worked. I went every day. I worked I, I didn't see the day of light. I worked every hour, all of them. I took three, three vacations in my life from zero to 27 years old. Three. How many did you take in the last year? So, I think that the things that we need to establish here today are five. You can be motivated, and there's going to be me and many other people that come up here, and you're going to feel really good. You're real pumped up. You're motivated. But if you do not understand who you are, zero chance. Once you figure out who you are, I'm good at this, or I'm good at that, then you need to find the pieces that you need around you, unless you're all-encompassing and you've got it like that, good for you. And then you've got to deploy real work. And I mean real, 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 real work. And your work has to map your ambition. I love when people are like, Gary, you're going to buy the Jets, and I'm going to buy the Clippers. And then I go on their social, and they ski every weekend. And then I go on their social, and they went to Coachella for eight days. Let me promise you something right now. If you're 31 years old, and you're going to Coachella for 10 straight days, you're not buying the fucking Clippers, asshole. <laughs> and that's the bottom 
lot of work. We need way, way, way more hard work. Way more hard work, way more self-awareness. And then finally, and this is a big one. This is a weird one. I'm believing it more and more. We need a lot more empathy. I'll take this real macro. We need a lot more empathy in life. Everybody's just decided that they're the king and queen of the world and everything they believe is the way it is and nobody else's opinion matters. We are lacking massive empathy in our society politically at a level I, I'm embarrassed of. We are lacking empathy in business. The reason I believe I am lucky enough to be standing on this stage today, as much as of it being perfectly parented, as much as it as being talent, as much as it as being gratitude and thankful for what I have, as much of it as it being self-awareness, and an obnoxious amount of hustle. I will tell you that I truly believe that empathy has as much, if not more, to do with why I'm here than anything else. Because when you are empathetic, many things happen. Number one, you can build big businesses. Do you know why? Empathy is the drug that allows you to build a big organization. Because you realize you work for them, not they work for you. The reason I built big companies is because I work for them. I work for them. That's what a leader does. You work for them. I'm empathetic that I make the most money at the company's a huge success. So of course, you know how many loser friends I have that get mad and say things to me like, my employees don't work as hard as I do. I'm like, are you giving them as much equity as you have? <laughs> of course they're not working as hard. If somebody wanted to work as hard as you, they would start their own goddamn business. The hell do you think they're doing for you? <laughs> Empathy. When you're empathetic, you become a great leader. You really value your employees. You care about them individually, one by one by one, and you do not judge. You know what's amazing about empathy? You don't judge. I don't care if my employees want to be the CEO of VaynerMedia or they want to make 90,000 a year and have incredible work-life balance and take five weeks vacation. All I ask is if they're self-aware, if they know what they're, you can't take 14 weeks vacation and be the CEO of my company. You just have to be self-aware, but I'm empathetic. You can do you however you want. I stand up here in front of you as a workaholic that is trying to build the greatest empire in business history, and that's just the bottom line, and so that's me. That's my life. That's who I am. I ask none of you to work as hard as I do. None. I naturally have it like that. I don't even know, I don't even know what drugs they put into me in Russia. But I'm still in there. The energy is off the charts. I am going to smoke a cigarette. I love when people like, leave comments about me on social. Like, what's this guy on? Gratitude, motherfucker. And it was very basic. And it's very hard. Self-awareness is hard. Most people don't have it. Ask the people around you what they think of you. Make them feel safe so they tell you the truth. That's a step to maybe get there. The reason I push hustle on my social network so much, my friends, is because it's the most controllable thing. Mm -hmm. Of all the things I'm talking to you about here today, the one thing you can actually control is a little less of House of Cards. It's the one thing you can control. I do not really know how to make you more self-aware. I do not know how to make you more grateful. I do not know how to make you more empathetic. It's hard. There's a lot of hard wiring there. There's a lot of parenting that needs to be undone. There's a lot of environment that I can't control. But what I do know is this. The hard work part is the most controllable, and that's why I push it so hard. Let's talk about tactics for the back end of this talk. Let's get into details. I've given you my framework, I've given you my passion, I've given you the things that I think they're not. But let's talk details. Facebook and Instagram. If you sit in the audience today, and you're trying to build a local business, a bar, or trying to build yourself up, as the fitness expert of fitness experts, or the greatest <laughs> vegan chef we've ever seen, if you are not winning on both Facebook and Instagram, you're in trouble. So if you're just playing Instagram because you think it's cool and you think Facebook is over, or if you've got a big audience on Facebook and you don't think you need Instagram, you're making a mistake, go all in. I believe that they are completely table stakes for entrepreneurship in a 2017 environment. You have to be on there, and you have to figure it out. You have to produce video, pictures, the written word, and all the above. It's content, 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 content. As much as you can pump out, you can give me every excuse. Give me every excuse. You can't, you can't afford it, you have time, great, then you will not win. If I don't do the push-ups, if I don't do the sit-ups, then my body's not gonna be in better shape. If I don't eat the right foods, then my body's not gonna be in good shape. If you do not put in the work, you lose. And 
I'm going to give you probably the most important part of this keynote right now. I'm gonna unlock something for all of you right now. It's very basic, but it is massively important, and I think it is the permission that all of you are looking for. The single biggest reason that most of you are not producing enough content on social networks today is that you're a perfectionist and you've already thought the content. And what that really means is the following. I want you to start thinking about the world differently. Instead of creating content, I want you to start documenting it. When you understand that it is documenting over creating, you will win. If you're worried about the lighting and the makeup and the background and the sound, you will be crippled and you will not produce content. If you're worried about how many likes you get in the first hour, if it's not right, you take it down because your self-esteem is wrapped up in it, you will lose. <laughs> you will. <laughs> because then you will not be able to produce the amount of that facts that you need to succeed. So if you don't know where to start and you own uh, a law firm, if you don't know where to start and you, uh, and you work at a company and you want to start building up your personal brand as the leading expert in Star Trek, the movies, you have to start putting out content. It is the only way to succeed, it is the only way to get the attention, and then you can deploy it into your business. If you become the person that talks about Star Trek every day, on Instagram and Facebook, and lots of people watch you, how do you make money? Lots of ways. You can start selling t-shirts with your reviews on it. You can start doing events and charging people to come and talk to you about it. You can do tons of things. You sell products, you sell services, you sell experiences. The business models don't change. No matter what you do, you're basically selling something or you're selling yourself and your time. That's it. Like, it's not super complicated. Well, how do I make money? I don't know. Sell something? Why do I receive you? I sold you one. Or build around what you're talking about. I became one of the leading voices in social media. I built a firm around it. And I didn't want to sell to my people because I want to give away the content for free. So I sold the biggest brands in the world. You know, the Pepsis and the Unilevers instead, which allowed me to continue to do what I do every day, which is the final thing, which is 5149. What does 5149 mean to me? It means the greatest model in business history. Are you, as an entrepreneur and a business, giving more value to your employees and customers than you're asking for in return? I wake up every day obsessed, obsessed, with the notion of how do I bring more value to the other person than they do to me, thus I have more leverage. Leverage is the game. Mm -hmm. Leverage is the game. My assistant Tyler has a fun job. He gets to see my inbox. Lots of things go on in my inbox. Crazy stuff. Like people that want to meet me or do things that we looked up to growing up. Famous people, this and that. The one thing he knows that I always ask is, did anybody on our team ask for this to happen, or did this come naturally? If it comes naturally, I'm all in. But I have no interest in giving somebody the upper hand that I want to see them over them wanting to see me, because I'm not willing to give up the leverage. You can call it ego, and it is, but I promise you what it really is, which is, I got nothing to say to you. It's gonna be a waste of your time and mine, because I don't want anything from you. I want you to want something from me. Then I want to have that leverage in my back pocket. And my greatest dream is I never ask for it. That is the ultimate, ultimate, ultimate form of giving. To give without expecting to receive. Because here's what happens, my friends. When you give without expectation of getting back, you get back at a macro that you could never imagine. Every morning I wake up, every morning I wake up on Instagram, and have 100 to 500 direct messages of people asking me for shit. My time, my money, my Rolodex, all of it. Ask, 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 and it is just noise. How could I possibly do that? I've just spent the rest of my life doing that. Why would I do that? I'd rather give that to my family and closest friends. We are in a society where people expect they expect people are giving them something. They expect. They expect that the government's going to take care of them. No matter who's in the White House, half the country thinks the government's going to do but right by that. They expect. I expect nothing. You know why I'm the happiest guy you'll ever meet? I have zero expectations of others. Zero. I have zero expectations of others. 
I am never let down in my business career, ever, because I don't expect a thing from anybody. And that is the greatest way to live. And these are the frameworks and mentalities that I'm trying to get you to debate in this room that can get you to success. Now, content. So I want to end with this because I want to give you something practical. I may be good on camera, and that was my gift. If you watch me try to put together two sentences, you would laugh your ass off. <laughs> Some of you got emails from me and direct messages. I can't spell, I have zero grammar skills, and the only reason I've written four New York Times bestsellers is because I have a ghostwriter who takes my words and transcribes them into English. <laughs> <laughs> Not capable. Which means that when the blogging era came along and I thought it was going to be huge, guess who sat on the sidelines? This guy. I didn't have the money to hire a writer to do what I do now. I surely couldn't communicate in writing form. But when YouTube came along, I went all in. You need to figure out your medium. This is back to self-awareness. You may be a great writer. You may be great at voice, podcasting. You may be great at video. And by the way, if you're great at video, do video because it is the number one platform. I mean, you may be a cartoonist. I don't know. But here's what I want you to figure out. Here today, now, what the hell do you want to happen? I live for legacy. I live for legacy. And so I know exactly what I want to do. I want to build the honey empire, the greatest business of all time, in the best way that it was ever done, from the heart, doing the right thing by everybody else, building the biggest building in town. Because that's it, my friends. There's only two ways to be the biggest. You either build the biggest building in town, or you tear down everybody else's buildings. And I think most people try to tear down everybody else's buildings. And my thing is, I'm talented enough to just build it. So I want to do that for one reason. I was very affected by Silicon Valley idolizing Steve Jobs, and everybody started treating their employees poorly because that's what he did. I want to build the biggest building, the greatest honey empire, because I want everybody to see that, holy crap, you can build a trillion dollar business by being a great person. Because I want all the kids that grow up now as an to look at me as the idol so that they treat the other human beings well, so they love meritocracy, so they love capitalism, not when it's convenient. I love capitalism so much that when I lose, I'm happy because I deserved it. Because that's the game we're playing. Figure out what content that suits you. Don't draw a line in the sand and tell me that, oh, I, I don't like social networks. Do all of them, learn all of them. If they come and go, it doesn't matter. The learnings will matter for you. Find your space, find your voice, work your face off, figure out what you're selling. Jab, 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 right hook for all the people that follow me, which means bring value, bring value, bring value, then ask. Too many of you think it means bring value, bring value, bring value, and then take. Let me clarify one more time. Give value, give value, give value, then ask. Never allow yourself to be disappointed. Never allow yourself to be disappointed. Customers are gonna let you down every day. And you can't let that stop you. It's optimism on the offense, my friends. Optimism on, on the offense. This is the greatest era to be alive. The data supports it. We have less global genocide. There's plenty of bad. You choose if it's good and bad. You choose if it's good and bad. You choose if it's good then. My mother lost her mother at five. Her dad went to jail for 10 years in Soviet Russia because he was Jewish. And she's the most optimistic person I know. My sister had the greatest life ever and complains every single day. <laughs> you choose. You. And once you choose, it's good. And once you understand self-awareness and empathy and hard work and the pillars, and once you understand the platforms that it's actually happening on, and once you stop complaining and just start doing, funny things start happening. Your life starts to change. Good stuff happens. But I'm going to leave you with this, and it's a pretty rogue statement. You need to stop complaining. Because the only people that are listening to you complain are the couple people that have to because they're that closely related to you and the other loser friends you have. So I think we should all close our mouths, execute around what we can actually accomplish, be patient, 
Everybody wants it now. Oh, I've been in business for a year, what's happening? Nothing. Okay, nothing should happen. Run the marathon with me. Run the marathon with me. Run the marathon with me. by Lane Kawaoka, an efficiency and productivity expert, traditionally educated with a BS in industrial engineering, master's in civil engineering and construction management, and professionally licensed engineer in Washington State, with over a decade of infield experience, supervising construction crews, and managing over $100 million capital projects in both bureaucratic, public, and corporate private sectors. And by the way, every situation is different, and remember to think for yourself.